I don't mean to give you a whiplash. I was just going to run this, and but I was going to run it maybe the way that you run it at 30 speed. Uh, you can't do that on YouTube. You can do it at two speed, but I guess you download it and run it at high speed. And so the last thing we were talking about was basically how if you're standing in a field or you think something's going on under your feet, how do you figure out exactly what those what it is under your feet? What does the plume look like? What does the distribution of rocks look like? And so there are three ways to be able to, to do that. You could uh, investigate it by using some direct methods, and those are either excavating um, with a backhoe or more typically by using drilling, uh, which comes in a variety of flavors. Um, of course, if you excavate the whole site, then the whole site's not there anymore. And so trenching by cutting a section across it is one way to get a picture of a cross section as it goes across it, uh, but doesn't destroy the, the aquifer in place. And so the methods of um, drilling fall into three categories. The first two are for soil. Uh, and one is augering, where you just screw a corkscrew into the ground. Uh, it comes in a couple of different styles, either hollow stem, where you can have a sampling tool inside it, and it leaves a casing once you pull a sampling tool out through it, or a solid stem, where it just screws into the ground like a screw. Or you can use some kind of rotary drill, which basically drills a hole and kicks up um, chips up to the surface and doesn't um, save any core, but leaves you with a hole, a hole uh, that you can then go back into and sample. Or you could use things like uh, rotary drilling. And rotary drilling will come up on the next one, just going through quickly. And rotary drilling is a way of advancing in rock where uh, basically you have a cylinder that has diamonds on the tip of the cylinder, it's rotated and it allows it to advance and a core goes up inside it that you can then retrieve and take to the surface and recreate basically what you have uh, in the subsurface. So those are the basic methods of, of exploring a site by drilling. And so we talked about that in that. Um, with augering, you make a hole and then you put some kind of sampler in there to recover samples. Um, and you can have problems in that the hole can collapse. Um, and the sampling is what we really talk about today. They come in three varieties. Um, you can imagine, I know this is going very quickly, you can imagine that if you have a hole, you can sample in soils in two varieties. Uh, you can sample for sands uh, and you can sample for fine grain clays and samples, sampling techniques you use are different in each of those. Uh, and we'll talk about those. And if you're advancing in rock, then you don't use either of those two methods. You use rock coring and the idea that within the rock, the core will go up inside a core barrel that you can then retrieve uh, up to the surface and put in a core tray and you'll know exactly what's down at depth. And so it's really the sampling that we're going to spend our time talking about. Uh, you looked at a whole bunch of different rigs, I think, uh, from then. This one is in the Caribbean and Montserrat. Uh, a drill barrel for rock coring. Um, uh, again, I won't talk. Uh, core barrels for taking core out without pulling all the drill stem. I think we would have talked about that last time. Uh, a core catcher to get the core barrel to take it up. Not a bad place to be working, you can see. Um, a drill rig at a radioactive waste site in Sweden, Forschmark, for low level radioactive waste. Uh, a drill site near the Arctic Circle uh, on a, a, a drill rig that can be carried by helicopter. The, the, the field season in the north is the winter time when it's frozen, you can get in and one in Massachusetts where we're drilling in Boston blue clay to try out a new instrument uh, in a setting that was only 20 feet deep. It would ultimately be deployed from a, the base of a, a drill hole in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, many thousands of, of feet deep. And a bunch of drill rigs set up in Western Alberta in the, uh, near Banff or Jasper in the, the Rockies. Um, and that was about it. And so uh, that's what we talked about uh, in 7.1. Uh, and so 7.2 is kind of a carry on from that. And the things to uh, discuss are how the differences uh, exist between sampling, I guess, if I can do this, 
uh, are different if they're in soil and rock. Um, and I suppose the things that we'd like to be able to get that we would say we'd like to be able to know what permeability is, we might like to know what density is, we might want to know what the particle size distribution is of the different uh, materials. We might like to know what the distribution coefficient is, what we've called KD. So you can imagine you can get that from samples. Um, and we might also do things in situ. We might like to measure what pressures are, pressure distributions. We might want to measure concentrations. We might use pressures to, to define what the pressure gradients are across the site to be able to do things like figure out what the velocities would be. And, and we might like to do things like figure out what dispersion is. And so you can imagine that we might also want to be able to uh, instrument the whole. And so that's really the second one of these that we're talking about. If you spend many thousands of dollars drilling a hole, those ones in Montserrat came out to basically a thousand dollars a meter. They're 200, uh, we drilled four 200 meter deep holes and it was $800,000 with the drilling budget. So if you're investing that kind of money and going down, that's very expensive. It's just because it was a, a very remote location, but usually it would be a hundred, uh, $150 a foot that you might pay for drill rig. So if you make that investment, you might want to do something with the, the empty hole you have. And there's another way that we can figure out what's in the subsurface, and that's by using what we refer to as continuous profiling, or uh, what's sometimes referred to as cone penetration testing, which is called such because you push a, a conical shaped tube into the ground and measure its resistance and measure the pore pressures. And we'll basically look at that as we go down the road. Okay. So, all right, I'm going to make my screen uh, full for the moment. And so we have this here. And I'm going to minimize your icon so I don't have to. Uh, I think you probably can't see that. All right. So, we made the, the case that once you have an open hole, at least for soils uh, and for rock as well, but certainly for soils, we're interested in being able to take a, a sample. And the samples form into uh, two categories. So for uh, sands, let's see if this works, uh, and gravels, coarse materials, you'll use what's re often referred to as a split barrel. And all it is is a tube that is actually split axially along its length into half, into two halves. Is pushed together and then a bit at the front and a coupling at the back attach this onto a drill string and so this is the drill string well this is the drill string would be up here it goes up to the surface and this is basically pushed into the bottom of the hole and as you push it into the bottom of the hole just like a cookie cutter the sand will rise up into it and then when you pull it out of the hole, twist it and pull it out of the hole, you retrieve the sand sample. Usually it has a little comb, if you can imagine a comb being around the outside that stops the sand just from washing out at the bottom. And this is also a little ball bearing in here because when you pull the, the, um, the split barrel out, there'll be a column of water in the hollow drill string. And if you just pull it out without a check valve here, it'll wash the sample out by the, the water that's present in the system. So in granular material that would easily wash out of this, it's a very thick, this is probably, um, I don't know, it's probably a tenth of an inch or two tenths of an inch thick wall here that's used to, to push in it. And it's physically banged into the ground. And you bang it uh, six inches, a foot, and then 18 inches, depending on how long the barrel is. And you count the number of blows it takes to bang it into the ground, and that's a, an indirect evaluation of the strength of the soil, not so useful in this class, and also you can correlate it with its propensity to, to liquefy in an earthquake, etc. In thin fine grain materials, so clays and silts, what you'll tend to use is what's called a Shelby tube or a thin walled sampler. Um, and it's like this, except it's a very thin wall with a very sharp, you can, you, I've cut myself some of these, you'll see later. Uh, same idea, a check valve to stop water uh, pushing out the sample once it's in there. There's no 
teeth comb to catch the core because it sits, sticks in here quite nicely. Uh, and this might be a 20th of an inch in diameter, in thickness, wall thickness. And it really can cut you and, and hurt you. Sometimes these come with um, a, a piston inside. So here you see the same pour barrel, but here there's a piston that rises up here. You can think of it like a hypodermic needle in tight inside a syringe. And so initially it's in contact with a sample at the bottom of the hole. And then as you push the tube into the material, you leave this on the top of the hole. And so now that when you pull it out, you can retract this a little further back and put a vacuum on it. And so the chances of losing your sample as you pull it out are even more greatly reduced than they would be in this case. And so for, for soils, the, these are the thick walled sampler, a thin walled sampler, a piston sampler, which is another form of thin walled sampler. Uh, and uh, if we're in rock, and we'll look at some more of these, I think we looked at them in 7.1, you'll use a, a diamond core barrel. So this, instead of being pushed into the, the bottom of the hole, it makes the hole as it turns, it abrades the material at the top, and the core rises within the core barrel, um, and usually it's a, maybe a doubled walled core barrel or triple walled core barrel that you can physically take the core up all the way up through the drill string without actually removing the, the drill pipe from the hole. So you don't, have to, and you don't have to trick the hole as they call it. Bring all the pipe out of the hole to get the sample. You can just pull it up through the, um, the interior of the, the drill stem. So those are the, the sampling methods that we have. I guess there's lots of advantages and disadvantages. Uh, perhaps it's not worthwhile going through those, but I guess this kind of encapsulates those three. These are the three. So this is a um, thin, thick walled core barrel, a so-called um, split barrel, it's split longitudinally. This is a thin walled sampler, a so-called Shelby tube, and this is a piston sampler. So all three of these are for soils. Uh, and these two are for clays and silts. And this is for sands and gravel, coarse grains versus fine grain. And a core barrel is for uh, rock. So they're all on, on one page. And you see the operating of this. This is the, the, what cuts into the rock. The core rises up inside here as you advance. Um, it goes into a core barrel. This is this little fishing tool that if you imagine this is a pair of pincers that clip onto the top of this assembly and physically pull this whole white thing out up through the top of the, the drill stream and then you break it open on the surface. So that's the, the deal for that. Um, so actually, why don't we look at some of these? So I, I put some um, things Try to look. Uh, I guess if I'm in full screen mode, it doesn't do that. So I need to do that. And if we look at, oh no, I don't want that. I was going to look at my photos. That's guess that's where they are. So if we look at some of these, if we look at this. So this is exactly what we talked about before. This is this piston sampler. Um, this is the thing that goes at the, um, against the, the, the soil and then you pull it up in here to be able to make sure that it retrieves the sample. Uh, it's perhaps not so clear here. I guess this is with that bottom, this bottom of the, the connector here, actually inside a Shelby tube. So this is this thin walled sampler. It's actually a brass tube um, that is you know, probably a foot and a half long four inches in diameter, I guess, something like this. Um, and this is physically pushed down into the bottom of the hole and then physically just pushed in with the weight of the, the rig into the base. Um, this is during drilling. Um, this is an, an open sample here, I'm not sure, standing around. That's a younger me, I'm not sure when this was, probably 15 years ago. And this is the, that piston that allows you to keep a vacuum in the tube. That's not a bad picture of it. So this is the tube, this is on the assembly, uh, and this is a drill rod that will be pushed down the hole. Um, those holes here 
that you uh, screw with an Allen key uh, screw. Actually, you screw the, unscrew the screw out into the brass tube from the assembly. You don't screw it in to attach it. And that's what attach the sampling tube as you put it down the hole. Uh, that's with it being retrieved. This has got a clay sample in it, Boston blue clay. I think this is a site up in near Boston in the dead of uh, December, cold. These are the little holes that attach it there. Uh, so that's the sample off there. That's the end of the tube. If I go one uh, page forward, this is what's called a torvane, T-O-R-V-A-N-E, torvane for torque. It's got these little paddle wheels on it and a spring that's like a torque wrench. You push it into the end of the clay. Uh, you turn it until it releases uh, when the spring, and that measures the, uh, the tension in the spring that allowed it to, to fail the material. And that records the uh, strength, the sheer strength of the soil to get an idea of that, it, not for our purposes in this class, but for building foundations on, on top of things, for instance. So a tor vein. And then once you've um, got the core out, then you want to seal it. And so this is uh, paraffin wax with a tiger torch on it, uh, heating it up. It's liquid, uh, you can see. And you pour it into the end of the uh, sample to basically lock in the moisture content of whatever moisture content it was. Um, you try and not put it on your fingers. And because I was, remember being uh, foolishly on a site on my own in the middle of the Rockies on a Sunday afternoon and trying to seal some of these tubes and poured red well, molten wax, it's wax basically, on my hand. And I remember that was a painful exercise to limp to the hospital, where by the way, all they would give me to, to salve my hand was preparation H. That's the only thing they had, which is some kind of pain relief cream, but not usually for your hand as you might know, uh, etc. And then put uh, caps on the, the top and bottom of it to protect the, um, the seal. So that's a thin walled sampler for san uh, uh, clays and for um, silts. And you take it back to the lab and do a permeability tests with it or grain size distribution tests, etc. So this, yeah, okay. So this is it coming out of the hole. These are little couplings. You screw these into the, the assembly to be able to release the, um, the Shelby tube from the, um, uh, the drill string. And that's again, as it, as it comes straight out. That's pushing screwing the screws into there. I guess I know when that was. I, you'll know when you get to, to being about 50 that you, you might, if you don't wear spectacles already, you have to use reading glasses. So I know that was probably less than, that was probably 12 years ago. Anything like, has to be, can't be more than 12 years ago. Yeah, and so you see the whole assembly in the back of, a, of the truck, Torvain. Yeah, and that's what it is, it's just a torque wrench. So it uh, increases the torque until it um, fails the soil. And that gives you an idea of the, uh, the, um, the strength of the soil, should you need it. All right, so that says something. Oh yeah, I guess that's not quite it. Um, I guess, let's look at, so I don't think I have, yeah. All right, I'm just gonna use something else for this. Um, if I look for this. This is the same deal. Um, I'm trying to think. I only want to see one particular part. I don't, I'm not sure I have a picture per se of a um, of a uh, a thin a thick walled sampler, uh, but this is how the sampling occurs. Uh, the, so the sampler is down the hole. This is drill string that comes up to the top of the hole. This is Hida Yasuhara, who is a former Japanese uh, graduate student at Penn State, taking a picture. Let's see if the guy does it. All right, so you can't hear it, but. So the, the sample's at the bottom of the hole, and this is just a, a trip hammer. You pull it up by running a, a rope around the capstan to be able to lift it up, and then you drop it down. It comes down with a standard force because it's a standard weight and a standard drop height and gravity. And you count how many blows it takes to go six inches, then a foot, then 18 inches as a measure of how dense the, the soil is. And 
indicates a correlation with its uh, strength. And then once you finish driving it all in, you pull out the whole assembly and you bring it up to the surface and you don't keep it sealed in the split spoon. You break it open into two halves by taking the shoe off it uh, and the heel and uh, you put the sample into bags. And I don't think I've got a picture of that happening here at all. No. That's the thin old sampler going back on there, ready to go in the hole. After a bit of dithering around, unfreezing pipe with a, a tiger torch. And then recovering the sample. So that's the uh, thin walled sample coming out of the hole after it's been sampled. And then put in the back of the truck. All right. So that's probably good enough for that. All right. So uh, all of this information, which you're paying a lot of money for, um, you'd probably uh, like to make the most of it. So typically a, a drill log will be completed. And here is uh, one from uh, Golders, I think it's Golders uh, log, which shows you the typical kinds of things that you might want to uh, record. So on the left hand side, um, there's an indication of, can you, can you see that at all? So if you look on the left hand side, you'll see that there's some indication of what the drilling method was. So it says a power auger, a hollow stem auger of a certain diameter, and then uh, casing was grouted into this hole. And then once the hole went from the clay into the rock, actually this is a Smithville site. This, you know, it's relevant to your assignments. Once you go into the rock, then all of a sudden the advanced method is uh, HQ rock core, 96 millimeter diameter. And it's done by air flush rotary, probably with the tricone bit, as you have seen one of the methods that we talked about last time. And so typically in the log would be a description of the material that is in the hole, brown to brownish gray, uh, medium grained, um, medium bedded dollar stone. So that's um, uh, limestone, dolomite is a magnesium limestone and et cetera. And some indication of the quality of the core as it comes up. And so you can't see that until you look at the top of the log. So a description of what the material is that's going into the hole. I'm not doing a very good job with my straight lines here because I was using my mouse. So some description of the material. Uh, a symbolic log, I guess, defines a symbol for the different soil and rock types, maybe a different color. Uh, elevations, apps, uh, relevant to the, the color elevation. This was Canadian, so it must be in meters, 192 meters above sea level. This is in Ontario. Um, the samples that are taken, uh, what sample number would be, I guess, number one, number two, etc. What type of sample, and um, these would be for the split spoon. You see this says, if you can't read it, it says blows per 0 0.3 meters per foot. So this is a split spoon sampler. Doesn't look like any were taken here. Um, so those samples, by our definition, right, these samples would be um, coarse grain samples, sands and gravels. Um, other ones that were recovered by um, Shelby tube or by the rock drilling would be given here. So this is the, the recovery, total core recovery. So if you advance five feet, how many feet of core do you get? Do you get four feet, in which case the recovery would be 80%, or do you get three feet, which would be uh, 60? Uh, how much of the core is solid in, uh, versus broken? What is the rock quality designation? Designation. So that is what percentage of the core is in pieces greater than four inches, just a, it's an arbitrary uh, designation, but it's, um, it's used to, to say something about what the quality of the rock is, again, for construction purposes rather than for us. Uh, this says fracture uh, number per meters. So by looking at the numbers of fractures in the core, you can say something about the spacing of the fractures. 
and something about the discontinuity data. Are they stained with iron stains, suggesting that water is flowing on them? Do they have crystals that are precipitated in them? And what is the dip amount of those fractures relative to the horizontal? Zero dip would be horizontal, 90 degrees would be vertical. Um, typically, finally, once you've drilled a hole, again, in the idea that you don't want to completely lose uh, the use of it, you put some instrumentation in it. So it's not unusual to put a well in a hole or a piezometer. We'll talk about piezometers later, but this defines that you have a standpipe coming up all the way to the surface from the bottom of the well. It's infilled around the standpipe with um, a porous uh, backfill, sand, and then it's capped off with um, a grouted in connection um, or a, a plug to stop this communicating with the stuff around it. So that now if you measure the pressure within this zone, you're measuring the pressure in this particular region and not in the whole world. And so this is just the design of a piezometer that's been installed within the pipe. Uh, and you know what the elevation is and you can record what the elevations of the fluid might be and what the other construction details are. And the other thing that is also useful in this piezometer, what you might also do is measure the permeability. And so you can imagine that if you take the, the water level within the pipe and you pour in some more water to raise the water level, then what you can do is you can measure how that water level changes as a function of time. So let me look like this, maybe. And you can use that to convert it into a hydraulic conductivity. So you can use this rate of decline of the, a very simple test. Just put a cup of, put a bottle of water in here to raise this level, monitor how quickly it goes down, a so-called slug test, S-L-U-G, because it's a slug of water, that kind of slug. Um, and you can get the permeability out of that. And so you note what that might be. And I'm not sure whether there's some numbers on this. Doesn't look like it. And so the bottom line is it's just making and then discussion of what the additional testing might have been. So, and so that is because it wouldn't be unusual for this to be your first job if you end up working in this game, to be your first activity, to be sent onto a site, to go and figure this out and to work with the drillers to be able to to log core and bring this back to the office. Some of you might have already done that. So that's what a log might look like. Um, can talk about all kinds of different ways of drilling holes and what the advantages are. Uh, probably not worthwhile doing that right now. We made the point um, that if you want to get the most out of your investment in a hole, the instrumentation you put in there, you'd like to be useful to. So putting in a piezometer to measure the, the pressures to be able to say what the pressure distribution or the contaminant distribution on site might be useful. And so pressures come as uh, standpipe piezometers, which is essentially the one that we just saw in that drill hole. Um, a little piece of one inch white PVC tubing that you use for plumbing in a house going into a, a sand pack at the bottom of the hole that you can drop um, a water level measuring gauge into. Uh, but and these are quite useful, of course, because you can physically blow liquid samples out of these holes. So you can actually sample for the, the fluid and its components that are dissolved in the fluid. Things like um, pneumatic piezometers, which are just a membrane uh, with an in-pipe, uh, return pipe that you blow a pressure into. When the pressure is equal to the water pressure, it makes a circuit with the exit pipe by pushing a membrane down or a, you know, a valve. And you know that at that pressure, that's the water pressure that you have in situ. Obviously from this, you can't recover a liquid sample. Electronic uh, pressure transducers, same principle, a membrane acted on by the pressure of the water, a strain gauge measures the deflection of this membrane, and you measure the strain in this strain gauge electronically at the surface. And it tells you exactly what the, um, downhole pressure is. Again, you can't get a sample back from this, a water sample. And then in the unsaturated zone where pressures are no longer positive, but they're in tension, then you need to use uh, a tens what's called a tensiometer, not, not surprisingly. 
or not surprising what the reason is. Tension, tension meter. Tension, tension meter, basically. Uh, and so if it uses water or mercury um, to measure a negative pressure within this thing, it allows you to be able to measure exactly what the negative pressures are. And so you remember when we talked about uh, the displacement of napples, we had some data which gave us negative pressures in the, the soil column profile from experiments, and those would have to be measured with the, the tensiometer. Sometimes you're interested to measure uh, flow rates uh, in well bores. You can do it in a variety of ways. Of course, measuring a flow rate will give you some idea of um, water moving up the borehole. So if you have a high permeability zone at the bottom of the hole, a high permeability zone at the top, and there are different pressures, once you put a borehole between them, then you might short circuit the system and allow fluid to go from one um, lower layer along the hole and into the upper layer. And so sometimes if you look at velocities of flow within the hole, along the hole, it can say something about what's going on. I think in 303, we did an example of what we called a, a spinner log, which is just a little impeller that gets dropped down the hole, usually in uh, petroleum holes, but it spins as it goes down the hole, so it tells you what the velocity of the fluid moving past it are. You drop it down, you pull it back at the same rate, and you look at the velocities of the impeller as it goes up, and clearly any difference in the, in the velocity at any point between going down and going up is due to the fact that you have net flow within the hole that is there when the instrument, the tool is not going in. So you can use that to measure flow velocities in hole. But if you have it in very tight rocks, then the only way you, you can do it, you can do it by having a, a hot wire, basically a hot wire anemometer, but now it's in water. It heats the water, you measure the temperature above or below that hot wire, and you can tell the direction of flow uh, by the, the invective transport of that heat pulse. You could have a tool that has these fingers around the hole that has a hot wire in the middle. And by measuring the temperature changes in the fingers around it, if it gets hot on this side, if you look at my finger, then you know the direction of flow is towards the, the ones that pick up the heat. And you can also use it by putting a borehole camera down the hole and just holding it static. And if you see particles of silt migrating one way or the other, again, you get some kind of idea of what's going on. And of course, the other thing that um, borehole cameras are used for are by pulling it along the column and you can log the material that is uh, present within the, the hole. And so getting some extra benefit from the hole is a, a useful uh, deal. The kind of piezometer that we just looked at on that borehole log are like this. The one you saw was just at the bottom of the hole and it dead ended, but you actually can put these zones at multiple locations uh, along the height of the hole. And so you'd have a hole that goes all the way down to somewhere. Um, and you seal off a portion of it by putting in a plug of either grout, which you tremmy down the hole in a uh, pipe to get it down to this exact location, or you can buy little uh, beads of pressed clay, bentonite, dried pressed, pressed clay uh, called pelotonite, pellets of bentonite, which are covered in lacquer, which you drop down the hole. They zoop, zoop down the hole because they're dense in the water and they start accumulating here. I'm trying to get rid of this. And then once they're here, the lacquer washes, dissolves off them, they swell and they block the hole. So then you put down uh, a white, one of these one inch pipes down to the base with some kind of cuts put in it. Um, you backfill this with some gravel by just loading it down the borehole and then you reseal the top again by dropping in these pellets of bentonite um, or by grouting it with uh, a dilute cement to be able to seal this off. These have very low permeability, top and bottom. And so when you're sampling fluids, the only pressure you're measuring in this zone by dropping a, either a pressure transducer down here or more normally just by just measuring the, the uh, water level, level within the hole, so you can get the water level within here by just dropping a, a water level meter in it. Uh, you can define the pressure and that pressure is for this zone. It's not for the whole 
well more because you've isolated a single zone that might be a meter or two meters or three meters in length. And the other thing you can do is you can also uh, evacuate the space by blowing water up here, by just blowing with gas pressure down here to evacuate a sample up to the top and then retrieve it to be able to use it um, to, to bottle it and then send it off to the lab for an assay. So the other way, and of course, we mentioned the fact that within this, you can also raise the level of water within the standpipe and watch how it decays to be able to measure the permeability of this just by measuring the height drop as a function of time and convert this into a, a, hydro, a permeability or a hydraulic conductivity. So that's the other useful thing you can do. In holes that have good quality rock, you can also use what's called a straddle packer. And so a straddle packer is just exactly what we've done before by sealing the bottom part and the top part of a zone. And this is the zone that we have here. This is our zone, I guess we'd call this our zone. But these are inflatable. So they're just balloons. Actually, there's just a, a mandrel with a sleeve of neoprene on it. Uh, they're inflated by lines from a nitrogen cylinder on the surface. They inflate against the wellbore and they seal the wellbore so no fluid can get past it, both top and bottom. And then you can either measure uh, the pressure in here or you can do uh, a slug test that just measures the change in head as a function of time uh, to, make, to be able to measure the permeability. And so you can measure the permeability at this location, you can deflate the packers, you can pull it up another 10 meters, inflate them, and measure sequentially along the, the, the well board. So you don't leave it in there. Uh, you do it just as an exploration technique where you might want to measure the native pressures within the uh, portion of the hole and also the, the permeability distribution along the hole. Um, although actually now, having said that, there are strings of these instruments that you can put into a hole as a permanent tool where instead of inflating these packers with a, a gas, nitrogen typically, or air, air would be just as good, you can actually use these two component swelling foams that you puncture, you rupture something, they mix and they expand uh, inside a sheath to be able to fill the hole and then you end up with a permanent uh, packer within your hole to be able to measure, uh, to, to be able to measure these things. So I don't know what else is here. I don't think we want to do this. Yeah, okay. Let's look at some pictures if we have some pictures again. So if we go to, I don't know, hope I don't show you any embarrassing pictures of myself. We wouldn't want that, would we? Uh, so what is, what is, we'll come back to this because we'll look at this. Oh, this is, uh, this is Korea. This is Korea's nuclear fuel waste disposal uh, test site. They've got a, an underground tunnel that they do expert, uh, they do test out techniques. These are a bunch of piezometers that go into a wall out of an underground tunnel to be able to run experiments and to measure pressures in, uh, in place, just as we talked about. This is Mizunami in Japan. This is a, a granite experimental nuclear waste repository on the main island. Um, where they have actually typical Japanese orderly, everything looks like you're going to the office here. You wouldn't think you're in a, an underground tunnel. But this is for experimental sites where they're doing tracer tests, inject a tracer and look at its time of arrival at some other location. You have all of these kinds of piezometers in the, uh, the rock which can um, receive the plume as it comes and you can recover material from that plume along these lines to be able to sample the concentration as a function of time as it arrives. Uh, so yeah, see all of these lines going into the wall. This is a borehole and these are individual tiny little capillaries which sample at different locations along the well bore. A drill, I think this is Monterrey in Switzerland, drilling into the, uh, the clays of an underground experimental uh, lab again, to do experiments related to storage of uh, nuclear wastes, to understand the processes related to storing nuclear wastes in clays in the Jura in Switzerland. Uh, 
the French part of Switzerland, okay. uh, where this is just a tunnel that has all of these kinds of piezometers going into the wall to measure injection experiments uh, in different formats. The borehole, I don't know why this is a movie. <laughs> Sorry if that surprised you. <laughs> it might have woken you up. And yeah, borehole with little breakouts. So these are bits of the borehole that have failed as a result of uh, the stresses. And you can actually use that to say something about what the in-situ stresses are. Christoph Nussbaum, who runs this particular facility, Zurich. Um, same site, again, actually, I think for um, some experiments. Uh, yeah, I think this is just a, a backfill experiment. So you recreate what the waste packages might look like. Uh, and you put heaters in here, and you backfill it in bentonite, and then you look at how, for instance, permeability and fluid migration changes over the months and years that you run the experiment, that you have it up to some temperature that represents the, uh, the temperature from inserted um, high-level radioa radioactive waste packets, the, the rods that come out of uh, reactors. These are all shales. Mm -hmm. This is one of those experiments at the end of a tunnel. And this little seat you see in the foreground is a little trolley that goes along this uh, carriageway. It goes along here to get you up to the experimental site to be able to uh, retrieve samples and cover medicine, uh, um, recover um, uh, data. This is St. Barbara, I think, the patron saint of uh, miners. You often see these in underground mines just as a I guess not, not a sacrifice, but a, uh, yeah, a, a de deity, I guess. This is an underground research lab in uh, granite in Grimsel in southern Switzerland. Again, for radioactive waste disposal, again, looking at transport of fluids as you know, the one mechanism by which things that escape from these canisters, these experimental canisters in this case, not real re radioactive waste, would get into the biosphere. Uh, this in the background actually is a packer. Now we talked about these neoprene packers pushed against the wall of a borehole. This is a huge packer here that seals off a fault, right? a big fault. So maybe it runs five, two kilometers, three kilometers in length, that maybe is uh, five meters in width. You know, this is a, I could stand up in here. Are people standing, there's a picture of people standing up. Yeah, you can see the scale of it from this. And that has, a neoprene sheath on the outside, and it's to be able to seal off the fault zone and to be able to take water samples from piezometers that go into the fault, again, to look at migration of these components as they move um, along the fault. Other experiments in place, not so relevant to what we're talking about. Yeah, you see these are pressure gauges measuring pressures in the subsurface and a packer. So this is a straddle packer. And so this is exactly, uh, these are two packers. The straddle would go in between here. Uh, this is just a, a mandrel, a piece of tube that has a neoprene uh, sheath on the top of it. It's inflated by gas going into one of these ports here. The second one is for gas that would go from this upper mandrel to the lower one to be able to inflate the lower one. So you can inflate them independently. It goes along the hole, and when it's at the place where you want it to be, then you just inflate it. And so this is in this uh, granite. It's underneath a dam in southern Switzerland that's used as an underground research lab to understand uh, uh, things like uh, disposal efficacy. And I don't, you see all kinds of things. So you, there's no scale there. You think it's small, but I think those crystals are probably four inches in width. It's huge. They're huge crystals, of course. They just happen to be there. I'm looking for something specifically. And then this final one is a, is a disused French underground ballistic missile uh, defense site. You know, silos for uh, ballistic missiles, which have now been removed. And it's repurposed uh, for civilian uses. And this happens to be a place where some underground transport experiments were run. So this is the straddle of the straddle packer. So this here is probably a foot or so or 18 inches in length. 
this is the upper packer uh, communicating with a, an airline to the lower packer. This is the neoprene sheath that exists on it. And this is the zone that you inject water into if you're running a, uh, a pump test. Yeah, and you see it right there. It would just be placed down the borehole. This is one of the entries into what would have been one of the silos, I suppose, uh, with a couple of colleagues of mine. This is where Roquefort cheese comes from. Um, and this again is an underground research experiment with a tool going into a hole in an underground research lab. And this is exactly it. This is a packer on the top, you see here. Uh, this is a fancy straddle tool uh, and a packer below. So it gets lowered down the hole, inflated against the hole to lock it in place. This is a kind of interesting tool because it actually has a little, little if you see this little cage here, it has some clamps above it and some clamps below it that clamp that cage onto the borehole. And it's typically clamped uh, either side of a fracture or a fault. You pump up the pressure in the fracture until the strength in the fault decreases that it reactivates and moves. And this little apparatus here measures the distortion as the upper and lower parts of the borehole move against each other. And so you can run a permeability test and you can measure the deformation as it shears or as the fault activates. Um, and you can use it to, to do some work that tells you something about how uh, injection induced earthquakes, like the ones you see in Oklahoma now, which have become prevalent, occur, the mechanisms by which they occur as you inject fluids uh, for disposal. Okay, 25 after, so we have oh, 25 minutes left, all right. So I'm trying to think exactly where we are with this. Um, and as to whether, oh yeah, so these actually, these are, oh, these are some um, figures from, actually from a place called Beishan in Northern China, in Gansu province. I don't know, we certainly have uh, some, I guess, Chinese uh, folks in the class. This is a drilling uh, job from last October uh, in Beishan. It's the Chinese, one of the Chinese proposed sites for uh, exploration for radioactive, high level radioactive waste. It's very low population density um, and it's being explored because one, people don't live there, not many people live there at all. And also the rock there is very uh, high quality, low fracture density granites. And so this is just a drill rig, drilling operation that has sampled all of these beautiful cores of really quite pristine uh, granite. Not so different from uh, drilling anywhere else. And uh, apparently that's Bei Shan, right? For the, the Chinese guys on, on the line, the two characters. I'm not sure what Bei Shan means, but uh, yeah, it's physical location. Uh, the water supply is a very dry region. So a, a water pit for the drilling to be able to lubricate the tools as they go down. And some of the rock is not as good as others. This is the recovered core from the drill string. And actually one of the reasons an adjacent site, which is probably gonna be the actual place where the Chinese are building a research lab, these are the actual cores that come out. So these are cores, they're probably 10 feet long. They're probably three meters long. And so if you, the ideal site for low permeability, we want that has no fractures in it. And so if you can stack core like this, uh, and it doesn't break, then not only is it unfractured, but also it's very, very strong. So the fact that it can stand there is really a testament as to how low permeability the, uh, the site is. So actually it's a really boring site scientifically because you'd like to be able to get water flowing in it to be able to look at it, but nothing, nothing moves in it. So it's kind of a, a bit of a, a dud in that regard. So, and they have camels there. <laughs> which is interesting. I'm not sure what else we have. Yeah, that's about it, I think. All right. Okay, so that's that for now. So the final thing that I wanted to get back to, if we go back to our, um, I'm trying to use, uh, if we go back to our outline, the final thing to talk about was, uh, well, not 7-1, the final thing to talk about was continuous soil profile. So we've talked about instrumentation, the instrumentation of piezometers and packers. Packers allow you to move, piezometers are st stuck in place, and they allow you to get samples and also get measurements of permeability. The other way you can get 
the information in soils at least for profiles of permeability and measurements of pressures with depth is by using some continuous profiling instrument, often called a CPT for a cone penetrometer. And the method by which that works is, it's not a very good picture here, but we'll look at some videos of what's going on. And that is, the, if you imagine that the inside of this truck, doesn't matter what we're doing here, the inside of this truck has these two hydraulic rams and this central rod uh, with a cable coming out of it. And so this rod at the base of it has a cone tip. And all that is done is this rod is physically driven into the ground. It's driven at two centimeters a second as a standard uh, velocity. And once this platform has pushed the penetrometer all the way down to the base, you've already screwed the next one on. And then this platform quickly retracts up to the top and keeps on pushing down the next, um, is it five? Is, I think it's more than, well, it might be a, it's either five foot or a, a one meter rod that is incremented each time. And so what happens is the reason for this cord coming out of here, this pre-looped through all the other lengths of the pipe that goes in it, the hollow pipe, uh, as it's pushed down, what this penetrometer does is it gets pushed down through the soil and it goes down at a velocity of two centimeters a second, just as a standard number that's achievable. And there is a load cell here and there's a load cell here that measures the forces. And so this load cell measures the force that's placed against this tip called uh, end bearing. often given the term Q sub T. And then this uh, cell here measures a force against this, which is really the uh, friction force on the side of the sleeve. So this is uh, friction force, which we call F, which is sleeve friction. And of course, it's the friction of the soil coming past this sleeve as this, this moves into the ground and the soil is static. And so you can measure the sleeve friction, the end bearing, and also usually in here, there's a little element that measures the pore pressure. And it measures the pore pressure as it's physically being driven into the ground. So you end up with these three measurements, sleeve friction, end bearing, and pore pressure. You get a profile of these, as you see in this little uh, diagram here as you go down in depth. So this would be tip resistance. I call it end bearing. This would be a friction ratio. So friction ratio is something like the sleeve friction divided by the end bearing minus the pore pressure. You'd have the pore pressure. Well, this is, this, I guess this would be this, right? This. And so these three profiles, plus other things, you could measure the electrical resistivity at the tip, and you could measure, some of them are used to measure the intensity of uh, fluorescence, uh, because some Dean apples will fluoresce when you put them in um, UV light, I suppose. But these three parameters, at any given depth, you'll end up with a magnitude, a unique magnitude of each of these three parameters. And so if you take these three parameters uh, and you calculate these three indices, so friction ratio, uh, we would have a particular depth and it would be some number. I don't know what that number would be. You'd have a value for the end bearing. And from this, you know that you're in soil type three, four, I guess this is five, right? And so you know that from those in the, that index data, you're in this, this material here, and it's clay silt to silty clay. So you know what the material is just from that. Likewise, you can do that with the measurement of the pore pressure. I call it P versus in situ pressure. This is the excess pressure that you develop when you're pushing something into the ground and it pushes it apart, it develops an excess pressure. 
So again, I guess you think that your end bearing must be here and your, sorry, your end bearing must be here and your uh, pore pressure ratio, just to get a number is here. So it identifies it as the same material. And so you can use this information uh, like this, just as an index to be able to index the magnitude of the, uh, to index what the material is that you're going through, because you don't get a sample out of this. You could stop the penetration and try and run an injection test at that depth if you wanted to measure permeability. Or actually, you could try and link the magnitude of this overpressure to the permeability. Because you imagine that if you push something into some soil and you push the soil and put an extra volume in it, it's almost like running an injection test, except you're injecting a steel cone rather than fluid. But it has the same effect and it would raise the, the fluid pressure. And if you look at the magnitude of the fluid pressure, if it's a really permeable soil, then it would have a hard time making a, a large pore pressure because as soon as you generated that pore pressure, it would leak off to the surroundings. In a clay, you'd think it'd be trapped in there. And so the magnitude of that high pore pressure is some index as to what the permeability, which should scale with the permeability of the soil. And so direct push technology, as this is called, cone penetrometer technology, is actually quite um, well used these days uh, by at least one company called um, Geopro. And I'm trying to look um, what it is. Actually, it's, it's back in here in photos, right? Uh, if I go back, and we go back to one of the ones, this is, uh, these are some movies, so do it full screen. This is exactly one of those instruments that we do at the time. We've got um, 15 minutes. So this is uh, a cone. This is the tube, hollow tube, uh, measuring the end bearing, sleeve friction forces and pore pressures along this green cable. The cable's pre-threaded along all the lengths of this, uh, with some spare ones here. This is the ram that will physically push it into the ground, uh, and it will happen kind of semi-continuously. And so it's been put in here, some of these moved. These are students, shouldn't do that, I guess on camera. <laughs> these are students, grad students in Turkey, a place called Izmir or Izmit is where the uh, earthquake on the North Anatolian Fault was 15 years ago now that unfortunately killed 30,000 people by buildings collapsing. And this is an investigation to look at the materials uh, and their susceptibility to collapse, liquefaction during an earthquake to try and understand that behavior by doing this sampling. And so if we run it again, you'll see what's going on. This um, ledge is going down, it's being driven at two centimeters a second. As it passes all the way down, as it gets lower down, you can put another uh, length up on the top here. You can scoot this all the way back to the top and then resume going down at uh, two centimeters a second. So when you put those elements in there, do I not have a picture here? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, this is a, when you put it into the ground, I guess that's too short. Sorry, you see threading the, the line through all of the, uh, the drill rods before it's pushed into the ground. And then the, uh, the tip, which is exactly what this is. So this is the little porous part that reads the pressure. Uh, this is the load cell that reads the end bearing on the tip. And there'll be a load cell up at the top that leads to uh, sleeve friction. So initially, to keep this porous stone saturated, it's saturated in silicon oil, and then it's locked in. Well, you can recognize what it's locked in with, I think, right? And uh, then this is just pushed into the ground. As soon as this goes into the ground, it gets ripped off by the, the soil around it. And then this uh, porous um, membrane or porous uh, material then measures the uh, pore pressure in the, uh, around the tip as it gets pushed into the ground. So, so this is doing exactly that. This is saturating the tip in, I think it's silicon oil in this particular case, to make sure that you don't get any air bubbles in here. 
because if you get air bubbles in here, air is compressible, and so it won't give a true measurement of the um, of the, the pressure that you see, because it will actually occlude the pore space that's in this porous material. So that's one of these uh, mach machines. This is this so-called geoprobe. You see it's on tracks, and there's no um, professional operator here. These are all grad students uh, doing this. And the other uh, exposition of this is using, oh, I just admitted one person, one extra person here. Uh, you might actually write on chat that you're here so that we know that you've almost lasted all the thing. Uh, and this is the final parting shot, if you like. These are uh, this one that we've already seen. I'll, I'll shut the volume down so you can hear this. I'm not sure exactly what we see here. I put some notes on things. Well, actually, probably we, did we already do this? Oh, we did this one. That's not, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this one. So this happens to be a slightly more sophisticated rig. This is a cone penetration rig, just as the other ones uh, we've talked about. Um, it's mounted on a truck. It pushes stuff down from below. That's me. Uh, it's a little unusual in that the rig has, uh, yeah, okay. This is the, uh, if you go down here, you'll find the tip of the probe. This is probably a meter back from the probe. And if this little white thing here is an LED, this little round thing here is a sapphire window, just like a watch, um, an analog watch face uh, window. And it has a little uh, camera in here. And what it does is it takes a continuous profile of the gradation of the soil as you go down through it. Both the grain size distribution, which you'd like to know, uh, but also the presence of denapples, if you find them as well. So it's a really kind of curious instrument. It's called the, the VIS CPT, V-I-S as in vision. CPT, vision CPT. Um, as we go through here, I'm not sure if you see, yeah, you get a, a TV camera to show you what's going on. So this is the same deal as before. This is the cone going into the ground. Instead of having a condom on it, uh, prophylactic, it's got a piece of bicycle inner tube around it that seals in the, uh, keeps the element saturated. Uh, here's the sleeve, uh, the, the load cell that measures the sleeve friction. This is the end bearing, uh, and this is just about to push it into the ground. Let's put it on fast speed until it gets going. And is it going? I don't know. Pretty uh, ancient TV monitor. Still not going yet. That still looks like the, the protective sheath. What else is going on? Yeah, okay. Uh, actually, I have notes to myself 10 minutes. At the 10 minute mark, what was I supposed to see the 10 minute? Yeah, okay, so you can't see much. You can see people taking pictures of the picture, but you get the idea that it gets pushed into the ground and it records this profile as a function of time. Okay, let's see if we can see what's going on here. Dismantling it. I'm trying to get a picture. Yeah, okay, so you get a picture of this. So this is the tip. This is where the CCD camera is here. So they're separated. So they, the time you get readings from here, you're delayed by whatever this length is divided by two centimeters a second before you see it here. But you can synchronize those records up after the, after the fact. This is a contract that's actually owned by University of Michigan, civil engineering guy, Roman Ritsu. The guy who works in civil engineering. And I'm trying to get a better picture of the sampler. Uh, maybe. If 
perhaps you can see it. Those are really just the couplings. So it's quite a delicate instrument, uh, but obviously it has to be ruggedized to be able to push it you know, 50 feet into the ground and to be able to withstand those stresses. So that's probably enough actually. I'm not sure whether we see anything else on, on this. So that's probably it. Um, so we've talked so far uh, about two things. On Thursday, the whole object of the class was to talk about how you get into the subsurface and make a hole uh, that you can do things from. And those things might be running tests, might be putting in instrumentation, instrumentation or ultimately from sampling from it. And today we've just been talking about the methods by which we can use those holes typically to be able to recover samples. They differ whether they're in soil or rock um, and what kinds of soil as well. Uh, granular soils versus fine grained soils. Uh, we want to put something in the hole to get the maximum benefit from the big investment we put into it. And typically that is to measure pressures and to measure permeabilities. Things and maybe measure concentrations and evolving concentrations of contaminants. And uh, the other ways to do it that don't involve drilling a hole would be to by continuous profiling uh, using something like a CPT. And of course you don't get samples there. You don't get a permanent hole, but you can push a, a profiling hole down in a couple of hours. Well, you can work it out. Two centimeters a second is basically continuous profiling. And so you can go as far as you can go probably 50 feet down and you can do it as quickly as you can advance because you don't have to stop for anything once you uh, start by. So that is about it. Um, next time, uh, the final thing we'll talk, I guess will be our final class in terms of uh, lecture material. And that is in terms of what happens if you don't want to drill and pepper your site with holes, uh, is there another way to figure out exactly what's going on in the subsurface? And so the way to do that is to be able to use geophysics. And so geophysics uses some measurement of a quantity like seismic velocity, electrical resistivity, um, to be able to correlate with the properties, hydrological properties, uh, the distribution of uh, bedding, for instance, uh, with what's in the subsurface, where now you don't actually drill a hole, or maybe you drill some holes, and then you use the geophysics to be able to fill in the gap between them in terms of what the stratigraphy and what the material properties are between those pieces where you have the control, maybe a couple of holes. And so we'll talk about those uh, next time. And so, um, 